The raw experience of going into nature is an important thing. Tom Thompson took a chance. Thompson understood the need to actually engage with the natural environment in order to, to understand who he was and what he could contribute. And I believe firmly that that is what is translated in the works. Tom Thompson's landscape paintings are also self-portraits. You can feel his presence on every painting. He imbues the landscape with the feelings. So his painting is not just, you know, a landscape painting. It's also a connection between himself and the land. Thompson's sense of poetry about Algonquin Park. It's focused on his whole relationship to the land and how he is in that land and trying to let his audience know what that experience is like. Not what it looks like, but what it's like being there. And I think that that's where the notion of spiritual or poetic is attributed to his work, beyond just the fact that they're beautiful paintings. Like every other Canadian, never mind Canadian art student, you know, like the group of seven is presented as something of significance. And it was immediate to me that I like Tom Thompson's paintings. There's a vitality to them. There's beautiful. So, as much as the Group of Seven, you know, and the idea of, you know, the Canadian landscape tradition and all these things, I mean, I understand it's there, it's nothing I really engage with, but certainly if you handed me a Tom Thompson, I would put it up on the wall. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. The story of the Group of Seven in some ways feeds into the story of colonialism. I do like the paintings, many of them. I don't know that much about them because I've resisted that certified national history about this jolly adventure of explorers having these like heroic individual experiences. And I feel like I could group Tom Thompson into that conversation of myths of what Canada supposedly is and has become because it's been constructed that way. You know, when I think about his subject being the Canadian natural landscape, and I think about climate change and climate justice, surely you could find a way to make that kind of revered art more productive in contemporary times than it is sitting in the dark waiting for an exhibition. And maybe selling the Tom Thompsons and donating the money to climate justice or, you know, like, isn't there, what would Tom <laughs> Thompson, amazing. what would Tom Thompson want to do if it was really about, this is his love, his subject, the Canadian North. The group of seven people have strong opinions uh, about their work. There was uh, a lot of pushback from the indigenous point of view that they were painting terra nullis and empty Canada. That might've been what they did, but I don't believe that they did it with that intent to exclude up until that point, Canadian landscape was all painted in the mimicry of European style and European romanticism of the European landscape. But in Europe, they don't have giant forests of changing colored maple leaves. So for them to really celebrate jack pine and northern pines and these wild landscapes that we have was really a radical thing in their time.
Authenticity is a really unique topic to me. Having experiences with handling an estate after an artist passes away. I come from a family of artists. So my father is Carl Beam and my mother, Anne Beam. They were both visual artists. My dad was a real trailblazer and he was the first indigenous artist to be purchased as a contemporary art by the National Gallery of Canada. I live in Cheyenne First Nation on Manitoulin Island and it's the largest freshwater island in the world. I'm a painter and a paint maker. Water and things of that nature pervade my work. Natural landscapes. The predominant subject matter in my work would be portraiture. I'm really fascinated in the human soul and how I can put the human soul into a piece of work. When I let things just arrive or show up or come to be, it's always so much more beautiful than intentionally trying to paint something. My formative years, I was a political activist and it was really very important to marry what was happening in the streets with what was happening in the studio. So I started using the body to represent ideas of what was happening culturally from a feminist perspective. The subject matter in the image may be a constructed set of an activity that I do. So there's a difference between subject and subject matter. I'm originally from the Six Nations, Mohawk on the Grand, and my predominant subject matter is mostly women. My mother, my sisters, my children, and my nieces. I like putting images in my work that can be translated in different ways. And sometimes, you know, people on first viewing won't see it, they won't recognize it, but maybe on the third or fourth viewing they'll say, oh, I, I never saw that before. So. That makes it more interesting for myself as the artist who created it, that other people can see different layers in the work. The subject matter initially was a completely self-indulgent process. I would come across images, in particular the one I can think of was like Oprah Winfrey's birthday party for, that she threw for Sidney Poitier and then like these insane uh, assemblage of thousand roses that were these centerpieces on this table and it was on a magazine rack and it was like a, this electric thing of like, oh, that is a perfect summary of the kind of egregiously wasteful display of wealth. I don't, I'm not sure that the painting actually says that, <laughs> but that was the motivation. But yeah, so that kind of random encounter was sufficient at the beginning for the practice. But then as soon as it became something I could make a living out of, the random encounter was completely unreliable <laughs> by its nature. And so then it became much more research-based. So the subject matter started out as excess. The technique is excessive. The amount of material is excessive. Like the effect is one of excess. My dad went to residential school. He went there only speaking Ojibwe and having an Ojibwe name and then coming out, the, you know, not speaking his own language and having had it like removed from him through abuse. All of his work really was about examining colonial viewpoints. We live inside a colonial framework that even without judging it is just to say that there are so many things that we do in an unthinking way that are totally normal to us that are part of a, a conditioned just because that's just how things are done. He wanted to be a free to be an artist, to be a painter. He never really was allowed to be that. He always had to be Carl, the political artist who is an indigenous person. And he explicitly states that in some of his work. The artworks that we've made come from a feminist and a queer perspective. That perspective has to be critical and not necessarily in a, a negative way, 
but that if you are identifying as a feminist artist and your work is grappling with the ideas that are troubled through feminism, it has to be critical of the institutions because the institutions are based in patriarchal, capitalist, colonial, classist, racist, sexist foundations. Let's throw in homophobic as well. So there's no way that your work would not be critical. A lot changed in my art practice when I started making paint. I think the first time that it really struck me was that I was out in a boat in the North Channel and we find these rocks and I, I'm collecting rocks and I take them back and I make paint out of them. And then I'm doing a painting in the, my studio of that place and of those rocks. And then I had this realization that I'm painting these rocks with paint made of these rocks. And it was this really neat, you know, circuitous moment. Most people feel that, oh, paint red is red and paint is paint. As a paint maker now, I'm really aware of how there's many different ways to get to red. Every component that goes into that is so identifiable at a molecular level. They're very different ways and they come from different places. They're made by different companies. They're very traceable. Uh, now we live in a different time where anyone has access to anything from all over. But even up to just 20 or 30 years ago, most artists are working with supplies from their local supplier. I haven't lived in Zimbabwe for about 23 years. So the longer I was away from home, the more connected I was with the storm. The material I work with is a type of volcanic rock unique to Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe means house of stone. It is one of the largest volcanic ridges in the world that did not erupt. I work exclusively with this rock in my practice. It helps me mediate my place here in Canada as an African. I let the stone guide the, the process. I'm interested in my relationship with the stone. I look at the forces that created the stone as like a co-creator. Think of some of the big rocks that even if I was to go up the mountain to get it by myself, I can't do that. So I have to work with a team. My whole process is like a collaboration. I would say the material that I mostly work in that's been consistent throughout my whole artist practice is paper. I really enjoy the tactileness. I also prefer paper that's been recycled or found on the street or something that has a little bit of, I always call it, life to it. So I work on the floor and I always bring an image up from the paper. Within the last maybe 15 years, I've actually started to invest my time in use of glass. Glass is a constant mirror of what we are as human beings. People carry cell phones in their pocket. We have computers that actually allow us to, to, to communicate from distance. It's all based upon the nature of glass. It's an old material. And yet we're finding that it has the capacity to extend our consciousness. We live in a world now which functions on the basis of glass and its major use for communications. We can look at things that are very small through the use of glass as a magnifying condition. We can look at things from a far distance through the use of glass as well. It's the same material, but it affords us to extend our human consciousness. I don't really think about style. I look for, for beauty. When I first traveled, that's when I first started questioning what the viewer wanted from me as an African artist. In the end, I didn't want to give what the viewer what they wanted from me. 
once you have arrived to a style, I think it's because you have gained an audience or maybe because you are selling. Once you are selling, it means it's working. But then if it's working, you probably don't want to try something new because trying something new can be pretty costly. I think a lot of artists are always looking to find their style. My own early work looks an awful lot like my mom and dad's because I was learning from them how to make a painting. And you're trying to find your own style. I think artists want to have a, a style that people know when they look at that work. Oh, that's, you know, and your name comes to mind. But there's an awful lot of experimentation in between. I try to break style as much as possible. And when I kind of get known for a particular style, I switch it up quite quickly. I find it's like repeating yourself. There's not a challenge there. And also too, it's quite boring. <laughs> My style has evolved and changed over the years. If I'm known one decade for drawing and painting, then I try to do the complete opposite the next, which would be maybe black and white photography or go into making sculpture or music or just another creative path. I like to characterize my own technique and my own style as being imagination first. In my practice, I don't really think about style because I go from like beadwork, painting, photography, sculpture, and uh, it's like, what's my idea and how am I going to get that idea done? Sometimes I finish something and I go, well, it's the weirdest thing I've ever done. <laughs> When you think about style and how an artist develops a voice or becomes known for a way of making things, I think that a dilemma of commercially successful artists would be when something that they produce sells well, that they are asked to reproduce that and it can be a bit of a trap to continue to reproduce the same sort of looking thing. But also on the subject of style, you have a style with your work as an individual. I also have a style. But when we do other projects like the Feminist Art Gallery or Killjoy's Castle, I mean, we're, we're talking about other ways of depicting style. Yeah. Like I would say chaos <laughs> would be a style that we have or derangement. It's so multidimensional that there is a style to it, but it's not described as you would describe style. Like it's, a brush, a particular kind of brush stroke. It's described as, <laughs> ooh. It's described in the language of large scale performance. Doesn't mean we don't have style. I mean, come on. Look at us. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> totally, right? <laughs>I don't think that I have ever signed a three-dimensional work in my life, ever. I think about signature a lot, and I always sign all my work on the back. I deal with notions of signature and dating from tradition because of my painter-printmaker training. So paintings are signed on the front lower right and as a printmaker if there's an addition you put the addition on the left the title in the center and the name and the date on the right the idea of signing a work especially on the face of the work i mean it just hasn't seemed like something to do sign them on the back <laughs> i sign my work hesitantly I think it ruins the work sometimes. It's like, you know, I ruined my work by signing it. Sometimes I make the signature too big and then sometimes I make it too small and it's like, ugh, have to start, rub it out, start all over. It's not like an oil painting with a signature at the bottom. We made this project called Killjoy's Castle, a lesbian feminist haunted house. And for that project over the years that we've done it, there's been Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. Hundreds of artists have contributed yeah. to that and yeah. nobody signs the work. It's something when I go into an art gallery is I see 
a big signature in, on a painting that really agitates me. Like I just like staring at what it is that I'm supposed to and then maybe I'll think about who created it after. I guess it's necessary for you to um, have ownership over what you've done. But I, I just find that it kind of ruins it for me, really, yeah, as the last thing you do on your painting. It kind of finishes the piece once you've signed it. I don't know, it feels like you're abandoning your work by signing it, you know? Okay, I'm done with you. Now leave me alone. <laughs> Whereas if you don't sign it ever, it's like you could still kind of float, float in and out of your work, you know? Well, my dad, he always signed his name on the bottom right, Carl Beam. But not every work gets signed. Most of them do, but I think there's a lot that you're doing them and you think you're going to come back to it, but then you don't. And so I've gone to his, his work and found, found those. And it's funny to describe that to uh, somebody. They're valued less for missing the signature. If the artist was habitually signing everything, missing a signature is just makes it practically not, well, it's not valued. So like significantly? Significantly. We have this interesting thing in our family that Beam is not actually our genetic name. We're not really related to any Beams directly. And his real last name was Miguance. And just through the tussle of the last century, he came to have that name. And when I was in my 20s, he said, I've come too far as Coral Beam. You could change it, though. But it, I really had that name as part of belonging to me. So we re ended up really redefining a name that didn't really belong to us. And then inhabiting this name. And now I've named my business Beam Paints after that name. So it's, it's definitely ours now. To sign the work has a lot to do with ego. There's no need to sign it to affirm the quote condition that it exists within. It is in itself a signature. The nature of the work which issues from me is a very, very specific understanding about who it is that I am, who it is who I, that I aspire to be, and the conditions surrounding that can't be faked. there was this one gallerist and he was like, I want to sell this work, I want to sell this work. And I was like, you're not breaking up my series. Like this is one series and one day it'll be shown as a full series. Or if somebody wants to collect it, they can collect the whole series. And he said to me, oh, that's so hard. That's not the way things are done. But I was like, trusting that that white person, place will come. One of the laws of the universe is the law of attraction and like attracts like. So I often just th think like most of the time those systems that aren't for me just aren't attracted to me and I'm not attracted to them. Like I've never had a commercial gallery ask me to be part of their system. The kind of work that I make isn't the kind of work that's gonna easily hang in someone's dining room. And yeah, I mean, my family, has works of mine that they don't hang. So I do think that my quote unquote client would be institutions. And so that's really quite an honor because you know institutions have to be very selective. But when a private collector purchases my work, the work form or content wise really touches them and you get to meet them and they're the people that you want to have it. It's important to them. I mean, that's an ultimate compliment. I've been fortunate enough to have my work purchased by the National Gallery. I think it's really kind of an honorable thing to happen. And I'm always surprised and excited when it does happen. It becomes pretty serious at that point. Because if I was to keep it for much longer, who knows, you know, like, oh, we don't need this painting anymore. I'm gonna paint over it. So it helps me look at my work in a much more serious way. For me, the works have to be found in a place or a repository which has the capacity to retain those works so they can be accessible to people. I'm not interested in my works going to someone in their home where they're hidden from view other than for a few people, but not available to a larger population. It limits the import of the work.
if people have dollars and cents dancing in their mind, it most often prevents them from getting the sense of the real value of a work. And so it's a commodity, it's a thing, and, and they don't care about the nature of what its real purpose was. We've lost sight of the real purpose of cultural objects in the first place. In 2011, I painted a vase that was interesting because of questions about its provenance and how it was valued. It had come up for auction at Bonhams and was presented as a beautiful example of Chinese porcelain and had an estimate, a high estimate, of millions of dollars. And then at the last minute, they were unsure about attribution, and so suddenly it was, minimum bid was $15,000 or something. So this vase ended up going for, I think it was $7.89 million. In reading about it, this idea of provenance being paramount in the West, you know, if it's a fake, then it's of no worth or very little worth, maybe a curiosity, but that the craftsmanship required to make a credible fake is of course comparable to the craftsmanship required to create the object in the first place. I appreciate the idea of enjoying an object for what it is as opposed to only enjoying an object based on who owned it or that it came from the original source. The fact that one could appreciate one object as being as valid as the other one I think is far more appealing to me than like dismissing it out of hand because, you know, because it's a fake. So I found it compelling. The institution enables collectors in, in ways that are problematic for artists. So when institutions choose to restrict and collectors choose to restrict an artwork to a certain level of provenance uh, that it has to be signed, all these things, they actually set themselves up for failure first because there's the vast majority of art is not made that way. We tend to want to help the museum move it a little bit more into more contemporary thinking about what it is that they're doing. And the people inside of them can see themselves as dismantlers yeah. rather than protectors of status quo. But unfortunately, I think the whole collection of art and how it's set up is only about the status quo. Because I think that they desire to have things quote unquote change, but they don't want to give up the power that they already hold. So you kind of can't have both can't of those both. things. It's like, how can we appear to be or like progressive, all progressive and all those kinds of things, but Not we're still gonna really keep our really board of directors. Them. We're still gonna keep yeah. our CEOs. Um, CEOs. We're still gonna keep our directors who are like from a long line of white settler right. cis men. The perfect collector or the perfect curator or the perfect institution would take all of the same risks that the most adventurous art of their times take and that collectors actually would be chosen by the artists, not vice versa. There's a real in, inversion of something fundamental that I think deforms the nature of art entirely. The Group of Seven. We're a group of gentlemanly painters who would go out into the wild during the summer, collect all their, you know, their sketches and their uh, rough work, and then come back into their own studio in the winter and, and paint these tableaus, what they've experienced. It sounds very nice. All these gentlemen just painting away. And <laughs> I think the question of Tom Thompson and all of the ways in which his work and the Group of Seven's work is authenticated in many ways created impossibilities for other artists. That a work has to have a signature, that the work has to be part of a group, which is part of a movement. It fit really nicely into a European art historical framework. Yeah. I remember that's where, you know, settler colonialism comes from. So it's these white European models that really are very problematic. Notions of authenticity and things like looting of historical sites to provide what is an authentic object. Yeah, there's all sorts of problematic things about what value is placed on authenticity. I was approached not too long ago by an institution that was offered an artwork supposedly by me. And they sent me a photograph to confirm whether or not it was mine. 
and I was mortified at the quality of the work. I wasn't pictured in the image, which I always am, and definitely it was not my work. So I was really grateful that they checked with me before putting my name on it. If somebody were trying to authenticate an artwork of mine or ours together, they would have a tough time trying to prove that we had made it. And partly that's because it is unusual. It's ephemeral, it's performance, or it's collaboratively made with a large group of people. We kind of defy and redefine authenticity, signature, style, and, and all the other things that you know a museum or a collector would need to create some sort of value. I like to dream of a different world where institutions and collectors actually value collectivity, connectivity, and if that were valued, that like the more that went into something as a culture, as mm. a collaboration, mm. we would be living in a different kind of world. Authentication puts a lot of authority to experts. And then really, you have to ask yourself how credible is that authority? Early on in managing my father's estate, I had an instance where an individual who was very well thought of in the artistic community made a comment on Facebook that they had seen some work of my father's and because they didn't recognize it, they stated, look at these fakes because they were signed Carl Beam, but visually they didn't match his expectation. And I had to track him down immediately and tell him really clearly that he was mistaken and that it was irresponsible of him to make statements like that without first checking with the estate. And part of that is because I think artists are by nature really adventurous, curious people. And especially over the span of a lifetime, artists are experimenting even ones that have a very defined visual style. So it's really difficult to declare yourself enough of an expert in one artist to be the arbiter of this is or this isn't. I'm not great with the whole idea of authentication. The basis of authentication has to do with the monetary value. And monetary value is essentially the problem. My own belief is the works that are much more significant to us have no real monetary value at all. What they have is essentially a spiritual value. I think that spiritual value outweighs the concerns for commodification. And yet people actually misunderstand the nature of the real transaction of a work of art. The means by which we understand ourselves as human beings, what we are, who we are, and what we can aspire to.